Thank you very much. Uh, I don't think you're hearing me, do you? Okay, perfect. So thanks for the introduction. I'm going to talk about uh, non-interactive commitments and tell you why we found them curious uh, together with Rafael at Cornell. And by the way, the full version of the paper is available on my homepage now. Hopefully it's going to appear in ePrint also pretty soon, depending on different factors. Uh, so a few words about modern cryptography and uh, one-way functions. So from 50s, after the work of Shannon, we know that um, many interesting things in cryptography are not possible to be done in an information theoretically secure way. So we are used to computational assumptions now. Uh, in modern cryptography, and in particular, one-way function has been a very central player, player in, this, uh, in this framework. So if you assume that some function is easily computable but hard to invert, you can do many things with it, uh, but this is not a very generous assumption. In fact, almost everything that we want to do in cryptography needs one way in a some way around the game. And just by assuming that one-way function exists, we can do lots of things like encryption, uh, signatures, and so on. So it has been very influential or very useful assumption. But this is not the only assumption that we have in crypto. We also have a stronger assumptions to do things that we cannot do with one-way function. One other assumption that I want to compare it with one-way function somehow is one-way permutation, very close to one-way function. It's a one-way function which in addition to being one-way, it's also a permutation. That's the definition. And there is a story about these two primitives. I call it a success story. So the story is that over and over, over the history of crypto, we started by doing something based on the assumption that one way permutation exists. And by the time, by hard work, we relaxed this assumption. We just used that it's a one to one one way function and then regular one way function. Eventually, we could do it just by assuming that there is one way function somewhere. And the examples are numerous in this story, like pseudo random generator is one, statistical zero knowledge or signatures. Um, but what makes this story probably even more interesting is that we know from early 80s that there is no direct way to go from one-way function to one-way permutation. So these two primitives are qualitatively different uh, in, a, in a good way that you can formalize it in a black box way. They're different, they're separated. However, anything that we wanted to really do and we did it based on one-way permutation, we ended up just doing it based on one-way function, at least for many cases. So one question that we, have in mind in this talk, in this work is, is it something that is going to happen all the time or there are some outliers to, the, to this phenomenon? Can we always substitute one-way permutation with one-way functions in uh, real applications that we care about? Or no, sometimes perhaps not. Or you can ask this question in a different way. Is there some natural cryptography task that you can do it based on one-way permutation but not based on one-way function? And when I say you cannot do it based on one way function, I have to be clear what I mean here because you should anticipate to prove it logically speaking. Uh, otherwise, we have to prove that one way function exists. This primitive doesn't. What we do is to restrict ourselves to a framework which is general enough and uh, interesting so that when we prove impossibility in that framework, it's still meaningful. And that is going to be the black box construction and separation framework. What is this framework? Well, if you think of some cryptographic construction right now in your mind, most probably it's going to be a black box one because most of our techniques in crypto are actually black box techniques in our constructions. What, what do we mean by black box? You want to do some task and you use some primitive, suppose this one-way function permutation, you really don't look at the code of this primitive, you only use the input output behavior and as opposed to this black box way, you can think of a non-black box way that you really look inside the code of the primitive, you really look at the gates, and you also rely on the fact that it's efficiently implemented. So when it's something black box, you don't care about efficiency, it could be highly inefficient, and you can still use it uh, as an oracle. And so many things are in fact black box, and the good thing is that they're usually more efficient, that's one other reason that we care about them, and there are more modular way of designing protocols. Like they can uh, incorporate things that are not really Turing machines, like human brain, for example. You can 
have them a part of your system design. Well, now that I mentioned this black box versus not black box, I want to also mention another, another success story that is relevant to us. The story is the following, that again, for many cases in crypto, we started with a non-black box construction of uh, some primitive based on some other primitive. And by the time we could manage to get rid of this non-black box feature and make it really the way that we want it to look like. We made them black box. And examples for this are from secure computation and also variants of commitment. And I also want to clarify that this successive story is not referring to security reductions. So in this talk, whenever I say black box, not black box, always I'm talking about the implementation of your protocol. And we know actually cases where non-black box proofs of security are provably stronger than black box proof of security. So this is not an area that I'm going to get into. I'm going to just stick to implementation reductions. So this is the second question, perhaps a little deeper than the first one. Is it possible to always get rid of non-black box use of primitives and make them black box construction? Or is there a case that a non-black box use of a primitive, primitive is in fact inherently useful, provably more useful? So these are the two questions that we study in this work. And our results are about answering these two questions using a primitive that you saw in the title. Uh, basically, it's going to be non-interactive commitments, the primitive that plays a central role in, in this work. I'm going to show it with NIC from so on, so just keep in mind this acronym. So the first result that we show is that it is known that one-way permutation can be used to obtain non-interactive commitments, but we show that you cannot use general one-way functions to get non-interactive commitments. So somehow for this application, these two primitives basically start to behave differently. The second result is that if you want to get non-interactive commitments, there is some cryptographic assumption that you can use it to obtain non-interactive commitments, but you have to really use it in a non-black box way in a provably uh, formal way. So you, there is a non-black box way to do it. You cannot do it in a black box way. So let's just briefly re remember what commitments are and what non-interactive commitments are. So a commitment scheme is just a di digital version of a secure vault. You want a protocol that simulates this game that I'm going to just show you. The game is that you have a sender. It has a secret bit B and wants to send it to the receiver, but not just a uh, uh, not just the bit B, it puts it inside a box and locks the box and sends it over, and we call this commitment phase. In the second phase, which we call it decommitment, uh, the sender is going to reveal the password of the box and the receiver can open it. So this, this picture, this process has a bunch of properties. It's hiding in the sense that the receiver doesn't know this bit before getting the password. It's binding in the sense that after sending the box, you cannot really change your mind about what you put inside it. And the way that I pictured it here, it's non-interactive. So there is not much interaction going on. There is only one message from sender to receiver in both phases. And you can think of many applications. It's quite basic primitive. So like zero knowledge coin tossing, many other things. And if you really uh, care about certain applications, you can use the fact that it's even non-interactive. And from, again, early 80s, we know that one permutation is sufficient as an assumption to get this primitive uh, based on yours, X or Lama, and the uh, hardcore bit of Lama Mikali. So this is the primitive that we care, and it's going to play a role. In the rest of the talk, I'm going to first show you a very high level of ideas of the black box separation that we get. And then I'm going to show you some assumption that is useful to get non-interactive commitments, but only in an inherently non-black box way. And depending on the time, some open questions toward the end. OK. So first black box separation from one-way function. Well, there is a general technique to separate things from one-way function. And this general technique goes back to the first paper that started this field by Impaglios and Rudish. The idea is pretty simple, uh, but pretty cute at the same time. It says, if you want to rule out black box transactions from one-way function, 
Well, because the construction that you're assuming it, it, it exists and you want to refute it, it's black box. It doesn't care whether your function, one-way function, is efficient or not. In particular, you can use a random function instead of an efficient function in your construction. And it still has to work as an implementation of your primitive. In this case, it's an uninteractive commitment. So if you use a random oracle, and if you can break your scheme with respect to this random oracle by asking only polynomially queries to this random oracle, then the conclusion is that you have obtained a black box separation. You have ruled out the possibility of this uh, black box construction. Why is it working this way? The point is that if you really break your scheme in the random oracle model, the security of your scheme, which is part of your, the design of your uh, primitive, would translate your attack into an attack against the random oracle. It would tell you how to invert a random oracle by only polynomial many queries. And that is easy to show that it's impossible because random oracle is uh, information theoretically one way. So that is the reason that if you could do this, you get a separation. Very simple framework. Can we use this framework in our setting? Well, we want to do this. We want to look at an implementation of non-interactive commitment in the random oracle model. We want to break it with few queries to the oracle. The problem is that we cannot do this. The reason is that relative to a random oracle, one-to-one one-way function exists. You can show that uh, not so hard. And if you have one-to-one one-way one function, you can still get non-interactive commitment. So we cannot really hope to use this framework the way I depicted it. But what we are going to do, we are going to modify this framework a little bit, and this time it's going to work for us. We are not using a completely random oracle in our proof. We are going to use something which we call partially fixed random oracle. It is close to a random oracle in the sense that it is fixed somehow over polynomially many points, and it's completely random on any other point. So you can see that if you look at this type of oracles, they could be highly far from being one-to-one. -one. This fixed part, you don't have full control over how they're fixed. Uh, what you only know about this oracle is that it's, it's random out of, that, out of that area. So the high level structure of the proof is like this. We want to break non-interactive commitments with respect to this type of oracle. We cannot hope to break the hiding and binding both because you can always get one, either, either of them information theoretically at the cost of sacrificing the other one. So what we can show is that you can break either of them. Namely, we show that in the random oracle model, either the receiver can guess what is inside the box by asking only polynomial queries actually with respect to random oracle. Or if this attack that I'm going to describe quickly fails, we show how a receiver can, uh, sorry, now a sender can cheat by sending a commitment and later on opening into both zero and one. So this, the first attack is very simple, it just says, you're the receiver, you get a commitment, you don't know what has happened on the sender side. Try to guess which queries the sender has asked from the random oracle, and ask those queries also, and after a while try to guess the content just by outputting a more likely value. What we show that if this simple attack fails, then the sender can cheat with respect to some partially fixed random oracle. So the, because of the time, I'm not gonna get into details, I'm just gonna show you how the oracle looks like from a very far perspective. So this oracle that the, the sender is going to use, this is the domain, this is the range. It's almost random everywhere, the dollar means random, but it is fixed over some parts of the domain. So the middle circle is the part that I fix it based on the attack that the receiver tried to do and it failed. So based on that attack, I'm going to come up with some partial function and I'm gonna fix it here. And because this fixed part does not reveal the bit B, you can show, it's easy to see that because it doesn't tell you the bit B, you can always extend this oracle in a way that it is consistent with some commitment to zero. Otherwise, you would know it's one. And the same argument tells you that you can always extend this oracle in a way that is consistent with, with some commitment to one. So the hard thing is to show that you can actually come up with single oracle that is consistent with both, both of them at the same time. This is the non-trivial part. And we show that this is actually possible using probabilistic method. Now what you get is that you get some oracle that is actually partially fixed, random, so it is a strongly one way, and with respect to this oracle, the sender can become into both zero and one after sending the commitment, which is a cheating strategy, so therefore you get a contradiction and you get the black box separation. Okay, 
So now we prove this theorem, no black box construction of non-interactive commitment from one wave function. This answers our first general question. Now I'm going to show you some assumption that you can use to get non-interactive commitment, but only in a non-black box way. First, just recall what we proved so far. No black box construction of non-interactive commitment from one wave function. The funny thing is that a couple of years ago, uh, Barak, Ong, and Vatan showed that actually you can use one wave function to get non-interactive commitment. So what's going on? They proved the opposite of our result. What they showed is that if you believe certain secret lower bounds, uh, you can use those lower bounds to get de-randomization uh, tools. And using those de-randomization tools, you can de-randomize NAOR's two-message protocol, which is based on one wave function, and you get a completely non-interactive commitment scheme. So the key point is not this assumption. The key point is that this construction is actually non-black box. It really uses the code of the uh, implementation of the scheme to de-randomize it. In particular, it uses the code of the one-way function as well. So these two are not contradictory. In fact, you can put them together. And under the same secret lower bound assumption, the conclusion is that you can obtain non-interactive commitments from one-way function only in a non-black box way. So this is a conditional answer to our second question. I don't like this conditional answer, so we make it unconditional. We go one step further. We show that if you go over our proof, which I'm not going to do quite like that, we, we see that there is a separation in a stronger form. We can separate non-interactive commitments not just from one function, but even if you assume that one-way function has some pseudorandom properties that we call a heating one-way function. And the nice thing about heating one-way function is that now you can use the heating one-way function also in the construction of BOV. And it is a still non-black box. However, you do not need the secret low bond assumption anymore because this heating property is basically what you need to de-randomize. So now we have a primitive there is no way to use it in a black box way to get non-interactive commitment. However, you can use it in a non-black box way to do so. Therefore, putting this together, we get some assumption that you can use it to get non-interactive commitment, but only in a non-black box way. As far as we know, this is the first pair of primitives that has this behavior. So far, we didn't have any pair of examples like that. But I didn't tell you what heating property is. I'm not really going to do it uh, completely. But in case you're really curious what the heating property is, you can read this. I'm not even going to read it completely. But a function f, we call it heating. If you can get heating set generators by enumerating f over a small fixed set, like 1, 2, 3, of n, n squared, you can get heating set generator. What is heating set generator? Well, it's a set that is going to intersect with many other sets from some family. That family has to do with efficient circuits that recognize most of their inputs. Well, it's a messy condition, but why we didn't find it so, so bad? The point is that random oracle actually does have this property. So it's a property that is not that far from conjecturing, like for example, AS does have this property. That's why we call it pseudorandom, basically. And the problem is that we didn't use random oracle in our separation, we used something else. Well, we used this oracle which was partially fixed. So is this oracle also heating? Well, this is not that easy to show. In fact, this is the technical part of the paper that uh, I refer you to the paper to see that we need to really argue about the way that this fixed part is fixed. And we have to argue that this is not going to make a problem for this set that we are going to use for, for the heating set generation. OK. so. Now I'm just going to briefly tell you one uh, or two open questions before that. So one reason to study non-interactive commitments is that they're useful. Another example of being useful is to get three message honest verifier zero knowledge schemes. So think of like GMW or uh, Blom's scheme. If you use a non-interactive commitment there, uh, you get some, some protocol which is not negligible error, but it has like weak error soundness. Can we do the same by one wave function rather than one wave permutation? So if you could prove an impossibility for this application, it would be stronger because uh, non-interactive commitment can be used for this. 
Well, we do not get a full separation here, but we show that if you can do this in a certain way, something surprising happens. You get program checkers for the class NP. And this is kind of a new type of assumption that very recently is being used, used to explain some barriers that we have in, in cryptography. We cannot do something. Well, we don't prove it's impossible. We just tell you that if you want to do it, you have to go back and solve a question which has been offer, open for 20 years. We don't know whether NP is checkable or not, but it seems to be pretty hard to do. And for doing this, we have to start from our black box construction and turn it into a proof system for co-NP where the prover has low complexity. That's basically the big picture of what's going on here, um, which we actually do. And the first thing is that this, this result is not general. We assume something about the protocol. This assumption is still includes something like GMW or Blum's protocol as a special case. So the first open question is to really get rid of this extra condition that I didn't describe and get program checker for any three message on as verifier zero knowledge. And perhaps more interestingly, uh, are there more pair of cryptography primitives that this phenomenon happens Namely, you can get a reduction there, but really the reduction cannot be black box. So this is the first, this is the first pair that we present in this work. The non-black box aspect really comes from the de-randomization uh, part, not from something like Cook Levin. So there might be more interesting cases. In, in particular, we defined a new primitive to answer this question. It would be more interesting to look at the primitives that are defined before our work. Probably that is the right way to call something natural as a primitive. Um, okay, that's it, and thank you very much. Thank you.